I'm Michael Hyam, and I'm very excited for this particular segment because I have two illustrious guests with me to talk about Project Cars 3s just announced. So I have Pete Morish, Production Director, and Joe Barron, Marketing and Esports Manager, to talk all about Project Cars 3. How are you guys doing? Yeah, all good. Really it's good. been a long time since I got called illustrious by anybody. <laughs> Uh, I'm excited about this because I I used to be a tuner. Uh, I was very much into the amateur racing scene. So I've always been attuned to Gran Turismo, Forza games, Project Cars 2, which is fairly recent, all things considered, on the, the racing sim scene. Now, um, what can you give the folks out there who may not be familiar with Project Cars 3, maybe have not seen the, the breakdown that you guys give, um, can you break down what's going on with Project Cars 3? So I think Project Cars as a franchise is pretty well known for um, its take on authenticity and it's known for being um, pretty, pretty beautiful um, to look at and it's known for its breadth and depth of content. Um, we kind of had a suspicion and this has been backed up from, from talking to people that um, Motors, motorsport simulation can be a little bit kind of po-faced, a little bit elitist, a little bit not fun or not in your face fun, if you know what I mean. Um, and, and so we, we really wanted to, to take what we'd achieved with Project Cars 2 in terms of authenticity and, and beauty and, and so on um, and just democratize it a little bit more to make it more appealing to more people. So. The, the, we we suspect that there's a that there's a bunch of people out there that are ready to to take their first step first toe in the water towards a more serious um, racing experience, and we want to kind of be a gateway drug for for, for those people because uh, as you can probably imagine, we we at Slightly Mad Studios are um, mad keen sim racers on the whole and petrol heads and and we like racing and we like cars and and so on and. We kind of want people to love the same things that we do, to, to, to see what it is that makes sim racing pretty special. I know, Joe, you had a lot to say beforehand, but uh, could you give a, like a little bit of an elevator pitch uh, for those who uh, maybe become, uh, are coming from Project Cars 2 to 3? You know, existing fans, as Pete said, is, are still being catered for with all the things that they really liked about the previous two games. So um, we do have this sort of all new career mode with, as you kind of hinted at in your introduction, kind of uh, upgradable cars, customizable cars and things that we haven't done before. Um, and on, but aside from all the new stuff, the kind of for the core fans, there's still all the sort of sandbox stuff that they really liked from the previous two games, meaning uh, if you want to go into to set up your own custom events, all the uh, cars and tracks and, and weather settings are and available to you from the beginning. Um, and then on the other side, we kind of, you know, can't go unnoticed that sim racing has really exploded as a genre in the current console generation. We certainly recognize our own part in, in supporting that. Um, but the genre isn't always super friendly to new people as, you know, motorsport itself is gathering new fans all the time, new, new generation of young fans, uh, and they need a way to learn about the principles of driving cars fast and driving cars fast is thrilling and fun and visceral and kind of scary sometimes the first few times you do it um, and i think sim racing sometimes takes the the minute detail and we've done this ourselves in the past takes the minute detail so seriously that they forget that it's meant to be this high intensity thing that uh, that really gets your blood pumping so the, the kind of entry level of the new game we've really made a lot of effort with improving the controller handling, which we did for Project Cars 2, but maybe didn't go as far as we needed to. That's come along a long way for the new game. Um, and then the way we handle assists so that they're uh, less intrusive than they were before and better for console players and kind of encouraging you with new experience systems that give you bigger bonuses as you turn assists off or turn the AI difficulty up to kind of challenge yourself to, to get better and better at the game. And then there's also real-time feedback while you're driving. So, um, you know, you're sort of Game, yeah, games telling you, oh, you've done this corner really well, or you've perfected this corner, or that overtake was dirty, that this one was clean, <laughs> these kinds of information is coming back to you in the, in the hood while you're driving as well. And again, the experienced guys, they know what they're, whether, what, you know, they know whether their driving is good or bad, they can turn that stuff off if they want to. But for everybody else, that it's giving them that extra feedback and information to help them you know, find their feet in the genre. I want to talk about career mode uh, because this is always the, this is the most exciting thing about going into a racing sim is building your profile as a racer. And I know you uh, both of y'all touched on it a little bit, but could you go a little bit more in depth or uh, point to the like the biggest things that are going to attract people to career mode this time compared to what Project Cars Two had? So I think with um, Project Cars Two, it was we we 
we were famed for kind of a, a sandbox approach, I think. So with a, with with a lot of other games, you, you kind of had to slowly unlock stuff, and and we gave pretty much all of our content out to to, to players from the get go. Um, possibly one of the things we, we 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 got a little bit wrong on on, on previous iterations or, or misjudged was was um, the, leaving people to find find the fun a little bit too much. So so almost kind of firing and forgetting and and leaving them to find their their, their own vehicles that they liked, their own tracks, the combinations and, and that sort of thing. And, and some people that found that very appealing. Other people wanted a little bit more support. Um, and so that's what we're doing with the with the career mode this time round. So the, the sandbox side of things, if you just want to jump in and, and, and race a certain car on a certain track in certain weather conditions, that's all there. And it's underpinned by the, the by, by an iteration, by an enhanced version of the of the, the physics and, and handling that, that we've had previously. Um, but yeah, the career mode is 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 much more of a of a gateway to it, it's more of a kind of greatest hits. It's it's I hate the word curated, but I can't think of a better one. At this point in the sentence, I'm going to go with it anyway. So it's much more of a curated, um, curated experience where we're we're taking people. It's it's less championship based, less race weekend based, less calendar based, and it's more about skipping from 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 track to track to track um, for shorter um, kind of more adrenaline hit sort of races. So it's it's not. It's not necessarily all about doing a championship and and finishing in the points every time to earn the rights to go to the, to the next race where you do the same and the same. We've got a wider spread of um, objectives to, to meet, um, more choice points, um, better support for people if and when they get stuck, um, better support for nudging people towards dialing back the difficulty, sorry, dialing, yeah, dialing back the difficulty in the assists and things like that. Um, and so on. Yeah, it, it's it's we're hoping that that it, it should be all things to all people in terms of um, experiencing the breadth and depth of content and in terms of, of kind of a friendlier, more democratic take on fairly on a more serious simulator style game. Uh, Joe, I, I know you. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit as well, and Pete touched on it. Is uh, the changes to assists? Now, not everyone is a professional driver. I think I might be, but uh, again, the, the, it seems like the the, uh, the goal. I'll is be to judge of that in a few months, Michael. <laughs> uh, it seems like the goal is to get more people on, though, and like make this less of a intimidating thing. Uh, but you've also, I think, the thing that stood out to me is how you explained. Uh, how race lines are changing and uh, could you go more in depth of how you're doing that? Yeah, so the kind of the breadth of the assist is what for the most part is what you would expect from a, a sim game in terms of things like traction control, stability control, anti-lock brakes, those kinds of things, it's stuff you're used to seeing in the menus of all racing games. But one of the things that we really wanted to get away from in terms of helping people to become better drivers was this idea of the kind of the main assist that everybody relies on when they start playing serious racing games which has been a key part of the genre for the last 10 years which is the racing line assist so showing you the the best route through the corners and, and breaking points and things like that and everyone including ourselves over the last as i say yeah last 10 years has been doing that with a painted line basically on the on the circuit that changes color when you need to break or lift off the throttle or get get back on the throttle and things like that and it basically becomes a crutch for people they start driving games uh, basically like their rhythm games they're waiting for the color to change or the line to change and reacting to it rather than building any sort of useful muscle memory for the, the car or the track or for driving in general so what we've done instead is we've thrown that away and replaced it with um, a braking marker or, or track marker system so the game is dynamically showing you uh, suggested braking points, suggested turn-in points, uh, the suggestion for the apex of the corner, which in layman terms is the kind of centre point and the exact point you want to hit as you're moving through the corner with the front wheels, uh, and then a point on the exit of the corner that you should be aiming for as you're as you're driving away and putting the throttle back on, and that adjusts dynamically depending on the car you're driving. And the cars are upgradable now, so it takes upgrades into account as well. And the idea is with that you're sort of without realising it, you're learning about where to brake on each circuit, where to brake in different classes of car, where to turn in. It's helping you to learn that oh, you can turn in later or earlier in this class of car because now you've got more downforce, maybe you're in an open wheel car, something like that. Um, and then it's less of a shock to the system than when you turn that stuff off. We see over the years with the traditional racing line assist when people first turn it off, it's almost like starting again because they suddenly realize, oh, I've been completely reliant on this thing. Whereas now this is 
building your muscle memory up and, and making you a better driver rather than uh, sort of almost like teaching you to play guitar hero or something like that. Yeah, that's that's a fairly good way to put it. You know, uh, I think that you know relying on racing lines can definitely make a racing game feel uh, monotonous if you don't use it as a uh, as a jumping off point. Uh, but speaking of like progress and getting better, I think that uh, you know we see a lot of games now are trying to build something around uh, like making progress and kind of unifying how much progress you're making in the game, whether it's like through experience points, levels, unlocking stuff. Can you go into depth about how Project Cars is uh, tackling that and giving players a better progression system? Yeah, basically we have this kind of hinted at earlier, this kind of overarching meta game layer. So whatever you're doing in the game, you're earning experience points that contribute uh, to your driver level. Um, uh, in the single player modes and in the multiplayer modes, you're building a, a personal garage of upgraded and customizable cars for the first time in the franchise. And your driver level is basically gating which cars you can buy at any one time. I use the word uh, buy as a relative term. We're talking in-game credits. There are no microtransactions, which is something we really wanted to avoid. Um, so yeah, the idea is, particularly in the single player career, if you happen to latch onto a car really early and or, you know, you've got a personal favorite really early on, you can, instead of spending your credits on a brand new car, next time you move up a class, you can upgrade the car you're already in. And all the cars have a performance index rating, which is essentially uh, a number that dictates which class they're in. And once, you, once it passes a certain level, the car moves up to the next class. Um, so yeah, you can carry a car through the whole career mode if you want to, within reason. Um, some of the Garou cars actually have full race upgrade kits to change them from, you, know, you can upgrade them and they're still a road car, but there comes a point where now they need to be a full-fledged race car and downforce and roll cages and all that sort of thing. So you, you can go as far as that with some of the road cars as well, which is cool. Uh, the only restriction we have really is um, that we don't let you sort of upgrade a road car to the point where you're racing against you know, you're putting it on track against an indie car or some other open wheel or something like that. You know, we have a, we do take pride as, as everybody knows in the authenticity of the game. And we're maintaining that in the sense that, you know, bespoke uh, cars and championships still remain as, as in that way. Um, but yeah, the rest of the game, as far as upgrading road cars, taking them into sort of the, particularly the GT classes, the sort of thoroughbred race cars based on road cars, you can certainly take them up through that route, which is really cool. Uh, and yeah, then customizable liveries, patterns, paint materials, paint colors, uh, sponsor stickers, all that kind of stuff as well, which mm -hmm. then all this stuff in, that you're doing to the cars in your garage carries into multiplayer as well. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, you're creating a sort of driver persona and a personalized experience that carries between all the modes. Compared to Project Cars 2, I, I was playing a little bit earlier this week in, in preparation, uh, as I had in the past, I played a lot of Project Cars 2. Um, what are you, uh, are there significant changes in the roster of cars this time around, um, since you can start upgrading cars in Project Cars 3? Sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's a matter of, of bigger, better, more, um, when it comes to vehicles and, and, um, and, uh, tracks. So we, we've got, I think at least 40 more, um, vehicles, including some manufacturers that, that haven't been in the franchise before, which is, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, and we've got 13 new track locations, um, each with a number of different track variants. Um, so, so we're up, um, yeah, we're, we're at some of the number on, on, on tracks now. Um, so there's a few that, that, that you'll have seen in the, in, in the video, um, that, 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 that we prepared and, and they're, um, Interlagos, which is the Brazilian, um, Grand Prix track and a couple of fictional tracks, one based in Tuscany, one based in Shanghai. Um, so they're, they're, they're kind of two different, the, the fictional ones are, are, are speaking to, to two different, um, I don't know, extremes or, or two different takes on, on an idealized fictional track. Shanghai is a city track, which has a very, very different persona at night than it does during the day. So at, at night, it's all neon and reflections and, and it, it's, it's, it's quite a thing to see. Um, the Tuscany track is much more about um, being in the countryside, that kind of road trip mentality, but treating the road trip as a racetrack instead. Um, but it, they're, they're, both, they're both excellent tracks. Um, created and, and, and created by people that, that understand how to bolt together a decent race, race track. We've, um, we've revisited all the tracks from uh, Project Cars 2 yeah. as well with a very nerdy fine tooth comb. Um, it's obviously <laughs> nearly three years since Project Cars 2 came out. So lots of the real world circuits that we already had have undergone safety changes or like 
types of curbs have changed and all sorts of little things. So we've, we've been back and done a nice review of those as well so that they're as accurate as they can be. I think that one of the one of the old criticisms I saw a lot of Project Cars 2 was the AI and how AI drivers behaved. Um, can you speak to the changes that you're making for Project Cars 3 in terms of how uh, AI behavior is handled? We've yeah. certainly looked at it a lot from the um, point of view of making them more consistent and sort of increasing the believability and we're not um we're not going so far as uh we're not rubber banding things to change the experience or anything like that we're very much about the authenticity um but we think now that for sure people are going to have a better experience in terms of um predictability in a positive sense you're going to start to be able to do the sorts of things you would expect to do against a real driver as far as understanding when they're going to turn in, when they're going to leave you space for an overtake, those kinds of things, and just making it more consistent across across the sort of huge variety of cars in the game as well, which will help people out a lot. Yeah, one, one area where um, people criticised Project Cars too a little bit was was as Joe mentioned the the, the inconsistency um, of AI, and it's it's quite a difficult thing to get right. So you, you can you can have it perfectly balanced for seven out of ten tracks, but then one or two of those other tracks can be the AI can be kind of unbeatable or it can be super easy, um, barely an inconvenience. And, and you need to be able to, we, we need that con consistency across the board. And, and yeah, we, we've given ourselves the bandwidth to, to sort itself out this time. You also mentioned that there's skill-based matchmaking in multiplayer. So if you don't want to play against uh, AI, there's a, all, of course, a multiplayer component. But uh, can you speak to some of the changes, especially skill-based matchmaking and how that works in Project Cars 3? Sure, it is a big change for us because you know, in the second game we had this uh, driver license system that was essentially when you were playing online rating your skill level, your uh, sort of how safely you drove and how fairly you drove as well in online races, but we didn't do enough with it in, in some ways. So that information was there and you could set up custom lobbies with restrictions on people's license level of who can, who can enter those lobbies or not. But this time we really needed to go one step further with that and we have done so. All the multiplayer modes have skill-based matchmaking, be that you know, pressing one button to jump into quick race or uh, doing something more serious. We've also got uh, uh, scheduled events, so that essentially means at sort of various times of the day, every single day, and all the time zones where the game will be available, you'll be able to look at a list of events which are sort of set by us as a development team, and they'll have certain cars, tracks, number of laps, weather conditions, things like that. You choose one from the menu, and then you can uh, you register for the race. You, you can jump into a qualifying session, set your qualifying time, and when the time comes for the scheduled event to start, everyone who's registered for the race gets matched together um, and then split into groups based on the, the driver license level that we're talking about and gets into the action that way, which is really cool. Uh, and then we've also we've still got custom lobbies and things for people who want to run league races or, or just race private races with their friends, stuff like that. And then we also have uh, Rivals mode, which is a kind of asynchronous daily, weekly and, and monthly challenges mode. Um, where we've really kind of gone one step further with, with this is to think about how people react to sort of leaderboard based modes. And often in racing games, the guys at the very top of the leaderboards, we all, in sim racing, the term that gets thrown around a lot is aliens, these kind of unbeatable seeming guys that people don't necessarily understand what it is that they're doing and just sort of watch in amazement that it's always hard to say. Mm -hmm how do I reach that level? And we've seen that ourselves as developers with people playing our games, you know, in development, we all sit around thinking, this is going brilliantly, look how quick I am, measuring yourself against the development team. And then you see the community and it changes your mind. So what we really wanted to do was to give people a level to aim at. So the leaderboards in the daily, weekly, monthly challenges are split into divisions. So what that means is, um, you're not just seeing the top 100 guys in the world, you might be seeing the top 10, top 30, top 50 guys in your division, and you can strive to be at the top of that division, even if you're not necessarily going to be one of the very top guys in the world in every single event. And then at the end of each month, the division cycle, some people get promoted to the next tier up, some, some people get demoted to the next tier down. Um, so that's going to be yeah, a really cool way for people to come back every day, get new challenges that we're setting for them and then really have a better way of not just gauging themselves against the community at large, but against their nearest rivals. Um, and then we also have dynamic ghosts in there as well. So not only are you, do you have the leaderboard as a measure for how you're doing, but if you are in, say, um, a time trial rivals event where lap time is the key thing that matters, 
the game will dynamically load the next ghosts at the end of every lap. So you're always being given the ghosts for the next few people ahead of you on the leaderboard. And you've got that kind of carrot on a stick to keep going and keep challenging yourself. So it's, it's all wrapped up in making sim racing more accessible and helping people to understand what will make them a better sim racer and then giving them kind of targets to aim for as well. Uh, Joe, I know it says that you're uh, your eSports manager. Is there anything you can share in terms of a push for e-racing with Project Cars 3? So yeah, we've been doing official competitions, world championships in the game since 2015 when the first one came out. And over those last five years, which is, feels like a long time, but isn't, I guess. <laughs> um, it's uh, it, yeah, We've been kind of getting more and more sophisticated every year and, and bigger and bigger partners. Uh, just last week, we announced um, the Logitech G Challenge, which is in its third year and is still carrying on uh, for the time being in Project Cars 2. And it, that's a really great example of the sorts of things we do, which are focused on uh, kind of grassroots sim racing and, and finding the next wave of talent that's going to come up and be the next sort of pro esports e sim racers, which is a uh, group of guys that's getting bigger and bigger all the time. But yeah, certainly for us, something we're proud of is looking for the next wave of, of talent coming through. Uh, and the prize for that competition actually is to uh, actually hoping the will calms down and allows us to do the prize in the, in the way we want to. Uh, but the prize is um, it's global competition, but the prize is an all expenses paid trip to London to come and uh, have an experience driving a McLaren race car and uh, get some driver training from Lando Norris, one of McLaren's Formula One drivers as well, both sim driver training and real world, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then, yeah, next year we'll uh, or probably starting towards the end of this year and coming back next year in, in full, we'll have the our next World Championship, which will switch obviously to Project Cars 3. And we'll have some announcements about that in, in due course in terms of who we're partnering with as the sponsors and stuff like that, which would be cool. You know, if we talked about a lot of different things and it seems like Project Cars 3 is doing a lot to, uh, to upgrade itself uh, from 2 and also differentiate itself from other sim racers out there. Uh, is there anything that you uh, that we haven't covered that you want to point out uh, with Project Cars 3 that'll get uh, either returning players or newcomers really excited about this? So one of the things that, that I, I, I quite like that we haven't really touched on is is we've talked a lot about the the authenticity and 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 the the intensity and viscerality and so on. Um, we we've, we're applying a, a bunch of kind of interesting um, graphical effects. So so we've we've upgraded the, the graphics engine um, in in this in this version of the game, and um, we we we've done that to, to almost from a stylistic point of view. So so when you when you're racing very very quickly if you if you're if you kind of got that that race driver tunnel vision where you're just focused on the on the next corner the um we kind of simulate the intensity so that we, we fictionalize a little bit in terms of, of maybe adding some motion blur around the edges of the screen and, and kind of really trying to simulate the the, the or, or nod to the intensity that, that a real life racing driver would um would experience and then snap them out of that when they crash or if they if they misjudge something then it then it, it's more of a shock to the system um so it's, it's some it's somewhere where we've amplified the effect of, by fictionalizing a little bit the the, the the effect of speed and the effect of the mm -hmm. sudden absent yeah and uh, from my side i think you know i also want to say thank you to, to the fans you know they're the reason that we're able to make a third game in the first place um and for, for a studio like ours to be in a position to do that uh, is obviously you know, really cool and then and um, you know, for the core fans on top of all this other stuff about you know, democratizing sim racing and, and bringing it to more people we've got lots of stuff that we're yet to announce for the for the fan base as well so you should definitely keep an eye out for some of the some surprises as far as new brands of cars coming in new, more new circuits that we've still got to reveal and there's going to be lots of stuff on on uh, people's wish lists that's going to start popping up over the next few months so yeah, definitely look forward to that pete joe thank you so much for joining me I'm uh, looking forward to this because uh, I haven't drove in a while since I've been living out here in San Francisco, but I'm looking forward to doing it again uh, when Project Cars 3 rolls around. So thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm.